Rodney, have you guys got everybody in your Avion system? Have you got everybody? I don't, I don't yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we'll get there. Okay, just so that you can hear it. What we do every year really is impossible if you think about it. It's this huge production that is a community theater show. And people ask me, how can you do that show? It takes so long to put it together. You just do it. You do it because you just enjoy it so much. I can't imagine what my childhood and adolescence would have been without David Wood, Theater in the Park, and A Christmas Carol. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of productions of A Christmas Carol. I guarantee you there's not another one like this. Coming in on 26. We see out of town people, we see people from other countries come in and just want to know what the show's all about. Where I'm from, there's never been a Christmas show that's really done that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your place's call for the first act. Your place's call for the first act. It is a touring Broadway show in every sense of the word at this point in its life. The time, Christmas Eve, 1843. The place, London, England. This marks the beginning of Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, a story that has been told through countless film, TV, and theater adaptations. And since the 1970s, a community theater in Raleigh has told that story in its own way to more than a million people. You're about to go behind the scenes of one of North Carolina's most revered holiday traditions, a tradition that can take a popular sports term and give it a new meaning. To begin, we go back to 1974. Summer was ending and a young theater director had his eyes on the holidays, a historically slow time for theater in the capital city. In 74, the theaters were closed in Raleigh. You didn't, um, you didn't go to see theater during the holidays. And I thought that was strange because um, that's a time when families want to go and be together and, and be entertained together. That led Ira David Wood III and his colleagues to an old theater standard. Well, we were doing a series on uh, Shakespeare. Uh, we had done Romeo and Juliet, Taming of the Shrew, and we were looking for a Christmas show. Willie the Sheik had not penned a Christmas show, so we went to the second best English author and we picked uh, Charles Dickens. He also turned to Deanne Jones, Theater in the Park's then president of the board. David was at my house and he said, we need to do a production of, Chris of A Christmas Carol before Wally, it's my son, gets too old to play Tiny Tim. Well, my mother worked here at the time too. So Deanne Jones and David worked here at the theater, so uh, it was all very brand new. So he said, get your typewriter. I got the typewriter. He said, look in the script and take all the dialogue out and write that down, type that in. And David Wood and Terry Mann and J.K. Farrell and, um, sat around my house and they wrote songs on the piano and it was a fairly conservative script when we started. But David had a different vision for his adaptation of the show creating a light-hearted story about a heavy-hearted moneylender. Why don't you all drop me? I, I wanted the show to be something that entire families could come to see together and enjoy. I wanted to, to interject uh, things that would be topical humor, and I wanted Scrooge in the second part of the show to carry a teddy bear. Did you take care of everything before you came to bed? You didn't, huh? All right, better take care of that right now. Come on, big fella. When Ira David Wood sits down and talks to you about comedy, you better pull out your notebook, turn on your recorder, because that man knows what he's talking about. He is one of the funniest human beings I have ever seen on the stage. She was just a walking down the street singing. 
little did I know that David Wood and all these crazy people that I had met would embellish it and grow it as we moved along. It was always, and still is, I think, a work in progress. People will say to me, it changes every year. And I say, oh no, you don't understand. It changes every night. One change occurred during the show's very first performance, and it all started with a nickname. Throughout the process, I got somehow referred to as uh, Tiny Turd. And I would say to him, come on, Tiny Turd, it's time to do the scene. And Wally would come up with his crutch. And there was a four-year-old little girl in the show who's a member of the Cratchit family. The young girl's name, Stephanie Doss. So, opening night, she's on stage and she has one line. Look, it's a pretty Christmas tree, Tiny Tim. And in a word, in a voice you could have heard to Virginia on opening night. She said, look, it's a pretty Christmas tree, Tiny Turd. Everyone on stage just stopped. <laughs> dead in their tracks. The audience paused for like three seconds and then just fell into just total laughter. <laughs> When they finally asked this child, what in the world possessed you to say that? This four-year-old looked at her mother and said, I thought it would get a laugh, and it did. Can't argue with success. No one could argue with the show's success either. I mean, the first year, we sold out. And we, I think we did something like 14 performances that first year. We just kept adding on a day and adding on a day. You know? And we had never made any money doing anything and so all of a sudden people were willing to pay money to see a show we were doing and that was very exciting. We sold the seat cushions off the sofas because uh, the first year of course we did it at Theater in the Park with only a seating capacity of a couple of hundred people. Seats that are in white are available. We got so many complaints from people who couldn't get tickets that the city asked us and the city was getting complaints too that they couldn't get a ticket because we could, you know, we could only seat so many here. And I think we did, uh, did the show at Theater in the Park for maybe three years before deciding, I tell you what, why don't we move down to Memorial Auditorium, play for a weekend, and play to as many people as we play to here at Theater in the Park. And when we wanted to go down, Deanne Jones and I wanted to look at the, the theater. No one could find the key. And there was a chain chaining one of the doors shut. And Deanne Jones, don't ask me why, had bolt cutters in the trunk of her car. I don't want to ask what she does or did with them. But we took the bolt cutters, cut the chain off the door of Memorial Auditorium, opened it into this dark dungeon of a space. But we walked in and said, well, this is a theater, and it's sitting unused. 30 some odd years later, we're still doing Christmas Carol. I don't think we ever intended to do it more than one year. At least I never thought we would. But it was so successful. I think in my heart, I knew we were going to do it more than once, even in 74. Because when you put that much time and love into putting something together, there's something um, lasting about it that, that you know. The show continues to last and grow Annually playing to more than 25,000 people in Raleigh's Memorial Auditorium, the Durham Performing Arts Center, and one year, even setting up shop in Chapel Hill at the Dean Smith Center. But the show's technical director remembers a simpler time. When we first started doing this show, there were like three of us that did the show. Now it takes 24 bodies to make this show work. Piping height on 26. Josh, line set 27. It is a touring Broadway show in every sense of the word at this point in its life. And like many touring Broadway shows, a large-scale production like Theater in the Park's A Christmas Carol requires equally professional equipment. We have a $1.2 million sound system that, that is the exact same quality as Broadway productions are using now. We have 40 channels of wireless microphone that are the finest in the land, literally. It's a huge leap for any show, much less a community theater show. Prior to making that leap, the show ran with less in almost every way, except one. It wasn't nearly as lavish, and we didn't have beautiful sets. And we had beautiful costumes, though, because my children were in the show, and I can sew. And I made beautiful costumes for everybody. 
And David said, Deanne, they were supposed to have patches. These are poor people. I said, well, these are not going to be poor people in this Christmas carol. But he made me go back and sew patches on some of the clothes, but they were really delicately and strategically placed patches. It's a look that continues today, only now there are more patch-wearing performers to worry about. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> there are a lot of people in this show. But given the show's majority of volunteer actors, it's a worry that's light on the wallet. Broadway shows can't even afford to have casts of 80. They can't afford to pay people that big a cast. So this show is, is, is in some ways, is bigger than something you would see come through like Deepak or Memorial Auditorium. The great thing about having as many people in the cast as you have is that it really is the community. It's, it's all of the community. 160 or so sets of costumes and most sets average about four pieces, four to five pieces. We topped out one year at 81 people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people to keep track of. That's a lot of people to get dressed. That's a lot of people to get from one place to another. But you kind of need a bigger cast with the bigger house, with the bigger set pieces. The bigger set came in 2004. After decades of playing the show on one level, the director wanted a change. To me, it, it got to be uninteresting to have 70 people on one level. Hard to see. When Because if I have, for instance, a bridge, I can put people underneath, I can put people on top, so I can actually, in some cases, increase the number of people on stage. David went to the North Carolina School of the Arts. I went to the North Carolina School of the Arts. Mark Parolo. It's, it's a lot, there's a lot more going on in this particular scene than this little backdrop would suggest. Was a, a faculty member at the School of the Arts as a scenic designer. Most of the things I do are nowhere near as big as Christmas Carol. Um, they're often quite small. They're sometimes very simple, sometimes a virtually bare stage. You know, this had to be something not only that would physically last for 20 years, but also that nobody's going to get sick of it. London during the, the period of, of the story was very depressing. Uh, you know, it wasn't a glamorous looking place at all. And I remember asking David if he wanted the show to reflect that kind of zany quality that the, that he brings to the show. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a shiny nose, they say, but it really doesn't matter. Dear season opens today. <laughs> and he was, he said, no, actually, I'd like to see what would happen if we kind of played it against a more traditional style. So I wanted to recreate it historically, but I wanted it to be bright, not, not quite comic book, but musical comedy. And Mark was amazing, absolutely amazing with what he did. In the opening scene, uh, we, you know, we were trying to make industrial London into something kind of fun. Uh, and so one of the reasons it has that big arch and the space going back and you can see St. Paul's Cathedral back there in the background is to give a kind of sense of beyond the kind of dingy little street that Scrooge's office is on. There's, there's a big world out there, and this big world is really all about celebrating Christmas. There are certain things we've played around with, you know, particularly when you go to Scrooge's domain, you know, his office and his bedroom. Both of those things have a bit more of that whimsical, weird perspectives and, you know, kind of off-kilter look to them. Hey, Bob. Yes, sir. Hey, come over here and close this file cabinet for me. <laughs> when the Mark Prolo set was done, the, the quality of the show just literally exploded. These set pieces are much larger, they're much more complicated. Uh, the drops, we have more drops than we had before. And that was my first year of calling the show, so we did, so all this stuff came in that people didn't know how to put together, didn't know quite how we were gonna move it around, at what point we were gonna move it around. The first time we took, Christmas Carol to Memorial Auditorium. They took it in an old Chevy station wagon that had been donated to the theater. And this last year, we took it to the same theater in three tractor trailers. We have everything because that's what it takes to, to get it done in the precise fashion that the show is now. I have a black and white monitor, and then I have a monitor that, that I watch Diane, which is its own particular show. The band is a community all to all by itself, and for me, there's you know I'm with the cast for 
months and then I, I, I actually have to kind of look at it like a divorce sort of like okay I'm leaving you now and I'm coming over here to be with the band and you're gonna see me and I'm gonna wave at you but I'm really with the band now <laughs> and because my energy is kind of divided between them I'm the only girl in that band and they're, they're sometimes, you know, some cranky, cranky boys, but they're, um, they're really good musicians <laughs> and they play really well and they have fun together. A few of those boys have played in the show almost as long as its headliner, causing mixed responses from their peers. <laughs> well, they, th they say it's really, really great or they say it's kind of pathetic, I think. I think it's like kind of a, kind of a, uh, between, you know, many people have gone on to fame and fortune since that, since that time and I'm still playing bass in the, in the orchestra, in the, in the pit combo, year after year after year. But the other thing about it is that since it's become such a big deal for Raleigh, uh, people say, well, I've heard that. I, 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 went, I went to see that one time, and I said, well, you've heard me play then, because I've, I've always played this show. The musicians have played this show for so long, some say they can do it in their sleep. By the time, it's, by the, time the end rolls around, you're really tired. Um, I honestly do think that it, I can close my eyes and, and, and just this music, just, I mean, I can. Uh, all of it, because I've played it for so long. Um, it's sort of like your hand has a map and, and, and it knows where to go. And even David Wood, we all talk about that. You know, wow, it's like we're still doing this. People always say, God, you, you guys are pretty small. We're only like nine people, but it's a big sound. When it first started, we were given some lead sheets, which I, I believe a piano player played the year before. And so there was no score, it was just all kind of a combo type, type of approach. Entire, entirely head arrangements. And as long as the group was small, that worked fine. And, that, and we would stay that way for several years. And then there were, then there were extra horns that came in to give it a, give it a fuller sound. And then there, so then there had to be some written music. Tom Bryan on the bass in the pit is incredible. Tom used to wear flip flops. And Tom has a big toe that keeps time to the music. And I'm gonna tell you, I wouldn't be on stage in Memorial Auditorium and be watching that big toe. Couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was hypnotic that a big toe all by itself could just keep time with the music. David always jokes about how he can keep time with his big toe and that's what he looks at. David says he looks down in the pit to see Tom's big toe keeping time. The musician, that's home for me. If I look in the pit, and to see Diane and the rest of the guys sitting around in the pit. To see them there and to know they're still part of the family, it's a blessing. While many members of that family return to the production every year, a few have gone on to carve out careers beyond the Carolinas. I just can't believe my eyes. You look at me as though you couldn't bear to lose me. Raleigh native Lauren Kennedy starred in Broadway productions of Sunset Boulevard, Spamalot, and Les Miserables. But before seeing the lights of Broadway, she made a stop at Theater in the Park. I believe I was seven or eight when I did Christmas Carol. I, I had just done Carousel before that at Meredith College, and then so Christmas Carol was the next show that I had, sort of professional show that I had done. May I elucidate? Oh, it's getting rather late, and I really have to go. It's, so, it's just so fun to go back and see it now and realize how much it actually still holds up. As a community theater, that's what's so amazing too. It's this huge production that is a community theater show. There you go, Maggie Darling, glad you're here. A local production made up of local actors with day jobs, like J.R. Richardson, a longtime band director at Broughton High School in Raleigh. Five, six, and five, six, ready, and... <laughs> And people ask me, how can, you, how can you do that show? It takes so long to put it together. You just do it. You do it because you just enjoy it so much. You know, and the rehearsals are tough, you know, and, and it's a lot of weekend times, but you do it because you enjoy it. Christmas is a time for giving, sharing, and peace. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people 
sometimes don't understand that it is a local show because they have for years gone to say New York or had seen touring shows come through Raleigh or in Durham and see the show and are blown away. A community theater show with a revenue stream that would make some Broadway shows envious, taking in more than a million dollars at the box office every December. It's not uncommon to see the pre-sales before the tickets go to the general public to do $200,000 here in the theater. That's not uncommon. And then you see six to 800,000 once it goes to the general public. Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three. Where I'm from, there's never been a Christmas show that's really done that. I didn't grow up going to the Nutcracker. I, you know, people just have their Christmas thing, so it's kind of cool. So before it's too late to make the pearly gate. I've met so many people that have said, we go every year, we've been going for 20 years, I can't believe that you're part of it. I just feel very proud of it. A little in your Five, six, seven, eight. You're hitting it on eight. Good job. Good. Christmas Carol is one of the most popular shows that, that, has ever, that have ever been produced in this theater. And uh, you know, as soon as it goes on sale, you have a, a line of people want to buy their tickets. We see people from other countries come in and just want to know what the show's all about. The show has gone to other countries several times, including a tour to France in 2009 and a tour to England in 1987, a year that formed powerful memories for one little girl. Well, I go, look, there's Ebenezer Stooge. <laughs> That's Brooke when she was eight years old. That's Brooke now in her 30s. Look, it's Ebenezer Stooge. I can't imagine what my childhood and adolescence would have been without David Wood, Theater in the Park, and A Christmas Carol. Um, it's probably been the number one influence on my entire life. I met my husband through the show. As they wandered the streets, he heard people say, the old miser's gone. But who cares, anyway? Um, my mother met my stepfather through the show. I got you. Now Brooke is even, for instance, thinking about when is the time that I can have my kids in the show, and so it keeps going. Brooke's stepfather is David Moore, a Christmas Carol fan turned cast member who joined the production in the early 90s, a rough time for him personally. A year or two after the first time I saw it, unfortunately, my marriage failed. And in the year after that, as a way of thinking, what will I do at Christmas? I, um, for some, for some reason, began to think about the show. After years performing in the show's ensemble, he auditioned for the show again, only this time to a different outcome. I came and auditioned for the show and then got an email that particular year and David said, uh, I'm casting you as Bob Cratchit. And I thought that it was a joke. And I waited for the next email to come, which said, just kidding. And uh, it, it didn't come. And so that year was uh, a, a huge learning year for me in the show. There's that time, for instance, when I, when I get to sing to Tiny Tim. Good night, Tim. I love you so very much. I love you too, Papa. And for me, it was not so much acting as it was remembering. One day, my son, when you are grown, you will remember all the happy times you and your dad have known. My dad died when I was 12. Somehow, by writing the lullaby, I think they would have been the words that my dad would have passed along to me. Go as far as you can go. Be all of you that you can be. Just to know I love you so. I love you on Christmas Day. Yeah.
I think of all the numbers in the show, I'm proudest of that because um, that's a Christmas present to myself every year. I think we all want to leave something behind. We, we all want to have some bit of immortality. We have it in our kids when we see them. I don't know what they're going to do, David, when you are done with this show. Who can replace you? Those are some mighty big uh, footprints to fill. When the day comes, I think it'll be exciting for him to turn the reins over to Ira. I think, I think Ira would knock her socks off. That day came on November 4th, 2010, when David's routine pre-show checkup led to the discovery of a defective heart valve. I, I knew I had to call my son. He asked me to come by the house. So I, I had had some, some thoughts in my head on the drive. Um, you know, is this the conversation I think it's gonna be? And when he walked in, I said, hello, Mr. Scrooge. And I think the color went out of his face. And there was a moment he looked at me and then he, he said, are you serious? And I said, I'm serious as a heart attack. And I absorbed that and, and uh, I said, okay. At rehearsal that night, David gave the news to the cast. They tell me I will be in for open heart surgery on next Friday. That means I will not be doing Scrooge this year. It's gonna be tough for me. Sit out a little bit and watch. Even though surgery kept David from playing Scrooge in 2010, a role he had played every December for more than half his life, that cloud had a silver lining. As soon as my name is Ebenezer Scrooge, that's the way I'm going to sing it. <laughs> this was a blessing in disguise, I think, if one can say that about open heart surgery. Because I was able to sit in the audience and see him do the role. To feel very strange at times, too, because I thought I was seeing myself on the stage. All right, children, here we are, the Cratchits. And I tell you what, um, be reindeer, be reindeer. Reindeer, they have to go to the bathroom, but that's okay, children. Having seen Ira on stage in the show doing Tiny Tim, when he actually walked out as a baby, I mean, at, at one point during the final act, Ira walked out on stage as a, a little baby, waddled out, and I picked him up and he was part of the scene. So I've seen him come from being a baby on that stage to suddenly, there he was as Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge! What? Ah! Whoa, whoa, clear, clear! This one's for you, Dad! <laughs> And thankfully, uh, I was allowed a walk on. And, and we um, blocked it so whenever Dad was feeling up to it, he would walk from stage right and I'd walk from stage left and we would pass each other and stop. I think what made it really special for me is knowing that my father was probably having an outer body experience to be able to look at Scrooge and have Scrooge look back at him. Jekyll and Hyde never get to see each other face to face and so I like that moment because I think he might have really liked that moment. You feel your own mortality, but at the same time, you're looking at tomorrow. You're looking at the future, and it's okay. The future looks good. I couldn't be happier that I had the good fortune to be at the right place at the right time to meet Ira David Wood and to be a part of Christmas Carol because it was certainly a gift to our family. It's a badge of honor. It's great. I mean, any time I bump into somebody and they're in the theater or we just start talking about the theater, eventually it will come up. He was the first Tiny Tim in The Christmas Carol. It's a special thing that they can never take away from me and I'll always have, which is really nice. Raleigh owns the show. It's, it's Raleigh's show. Um, it's like a little Christmas present every year that we give them. It's a tradition and something I'd like to keep going because it seems too special to let fade away. To have made people laugh, to have made people maybe shed a few happy tears, but to come closer to the spirit and the meaning of Christmas, that's not a bad thing to leave behind at all.